When will my reflection show who I am inside? That's a great question. And you know, as religious scientists, we look at that question, and it kind of has two parts. One is, you look at this idea of our reflection. Well, we know that our reflection really is a composite of our ideas and our thoughts and our beliefs, right? And then, who we are inside. And what, we, what do we know about who we are inside? We know that we are whole, that we are perfect, that we are complete, that we are God in physical form, expressing itself through us. So that question has a wonderful meaning. When will our reflection show who we are inside? And I can tell you that it's a process, isn't it? It really is a process. A spiritually mindful person goes through this process. So what does it mean to be spiritually mindful? Well, the first thing that I know is that there is a power that is greater than me that I am able to use to deal with life effectively. And the second part of that is there is a principle, a principle that I can depend upon. I can depend upon this principle and know that it is so as much as I know that if I were to drop a pen right here in my hands, it would drop to the ground. There's a principle that I know that is available to me that I can use that changes my thought into my experience. When will my reflection show who I am inside? It's a process. And in that process, we have to do a lot of things. And one of the things we have to do is we have to learn to let go. Right? Because remember, it's our thought that determines, really, our reflection. And so if our reflection isn't reflecting that truth of who we are, then we have some thoughts we need to to probably change, right? And then there's this other process as, as, as we're going out and we're changing our thoughts or we're releasing our thoughts, then we're embracing a new thought that replaces that thought. So this is a process that people that are spiritually mindful are comfortable with. Why? Because we know that it is through this process that we expand our consciousness. We know that it is through this process that we get to that place where we are truly reflecting who we are inside, that truth of who we are. So the idea here is it is through our thoughts that we create our experience, right? Everybody in agreement with that? So doesn't it make sense that we have the most constructive thoughts we can possibly come up with? So what is the most constructive thought that we can have? Life is fabulous. Life is fabulous, yes. We are one. We are one, absolutely. Love is everything. everything. The greatest, most constructive thought that we can have is our identity in God. Who we are. That is the most constructive thought that we could possibly dream of. And as we go through this path and and down this path, we begin to realize, and we're going to get into that in the lesson, that we can replace our thoughts. And any time that we have an opportunity to replace a thought that, w- that we have with a more constructive thought, let's take, let's take advantage of it. You see, this process, it kind of reminds me of the monkey bars. Do you remember that when you're a kid, you know, swinging on the bars of the rings or whatever? And you get up and, let me take just a little sip here. You get up on the monkey bars and, and I don't know about you, but I had older siblings, you know. And uh, so I was, uh, it was hard for me to even get up on the bar. So when I finally did get up on the bar, I'm holding on to it. It was like, oh, finally, I made it. 
But then you hold on for just so long, and then what happens? You drop down onto the ground, right? So then, then you watch these other kids, and they're moving along the monkey bars, and you realize in order to get off that one monkey bar, you're going to have to let go, and you're going to have to reach out, and you're going to have to grab the next one. Okay, so finally, you kind of let go of one, and you reach, and you can't quite reach because, because you haven't got to the point yet where you're coordinating the swing into it, you know, so you're kind of there, and you kind of hang on, you hang there, and then you fall to the ground, right? <laughs> Maybe that's just me, I don't know, but, so then finally, you get there, and you swing, and you reach out, and you get the other one, and it's like, this is a major accomplishment, Right? So what's the next thing that has to happen? <laughs> you got to go to the next one. <laughs> and you're frozen. Because you haven't quite mastered that swing yet, you know. And then eventually you get that one, and you get that, and then you get to the next one, and you get to the next one, and then to the next one. Well, I kind of look at it the same way. In order to move forward, there are, just, there are things that we just have to let go of. And we have to let go of and grasp and grab on to the next thing. It's kind of like our spiritual monkey bars. This morning, what I really want to talk about, though, is letting go. The, you know, our, uh, our whole um, the theme this month is about surrender. And so I wanted to talk about letting go. And there are a lot of areas, a lot of things, and a lot of ways, and a lot of places that we can let go in. But I wanted to tell you a story about my daughter. I have three children. Macy, who you met. I have a 14-year-old daughter named Mallory. And I have a, a son that's 23, and his name is Matthew. And the story I want to share with you is about my daughter, Mallory, who is up in um, Lake Tahoe right now in a softball tournament with her mother. Her mother's not playing, just Mallory. <laughs> And it was uh, several years ago that I took a, uh, a class on, um, oh shoot, it was uh, nonviolent communication, okay? And I know a lot of people here are familiar with that. And nonviolent non communication is all about communicating in a way of really understanding feelings and needs, right? And so we had this assignment. And the assignment was to, to engage our family and really talk about feelings and needs. So I picked Mallory up, and she was like six years old. So this is a while ago. She's six years old. And so I pick her up from school, and she's got this big smile on her face. Her eyes are just gleaming. She, you know, cheeks are red, and I can tell she's filled with excitement. And she sits in the back, and I look in my rearview mirror as we're going along, and I said, Mallory, how was school today? Oh, Daddy, it was fantastic. It was so good. I said, really? I said, well, you know, what happened? She said, a boy told me she, that he liked me. <laughs> so I said, I said, well, how did that make you feel? It made me feel hot, Daddy. <laughs> it was at that moment that I knew that I was in way over my head. I also had no intention of following up to see what needs were being met. Fast forward to last week. Mallory came running out of her room, and she had a big smile on her face, and her eyes were sparkling. Cheeks were red. She was filled with excitement. And I said, Mallory, what's going on? What's happening? Oh, Daddy, I was just asked to go on a date with a boy. <laughs> She's 14. And at that moment, I just sort of froze. <laughs> because there was something inside me that was not feeling, I was feeling happy for her, but there was something inside me that wasn't feeling right. And so I have learned that I just need to stop. I just need to hold off. 
And she was so excited, and I was excited for her in that regard, but she wanted to know, go, can I go, can I go, you know, all this. I said, well, let's just wait, I've got to think about this. So I took it to prayer. And I thought to myself, what is it, what is this apprehension? What is that about? And what I came to was a certain level of fear. Fear that she may not know how to handle herself in certain situations. And so, rather than dwell in this idea of fear, I then began to think, what is it I would really like to see happen? Besides her never going out, you know, <laughs> not going to happen. And I began to envision this young lady that is filled with confidence, that knows exactly what she wants to do and needs to do. A young lady that knows how to make decisions and good decisions. And I began to see her in that light. And I began to see a path for that happening. Maybe that wasn't happening right now, but that could happen. And I began to envision, instead of her going out on a date, perhaps she is going out with a group of people that are going out and having a good time together. So I finished all of that, and I sat down, and I talked to my wife. And I explained what Mallory had told me, and she said, well, she's gonna, she can't go on a date. She has to go on a group date. And I said, you mean I went through all that, and you just already knew that? <laughs> So then we sat down with Mallory and we, we told her, you know, we sat down with her and we said, okay, here's, here's the deal. And as we are telling her, she gets a call from this gentleman telling her that his mom isn't going to let her go out on a date because she thinks that they should go on a group date. <laughs> the point of all this is, is this. What I have been learning is that when I sense certain amount of tension, anxiety, whatever it might be, if I stop, I go inside because I know that there's something that I need to let go of. And that really is what this whole path is all about. And in our lives, there are many things, many areas of our life where we have different situations, whether it's um, things like jobs, that we may be past jobs that we need to let go of, or maybe a current job we need to let go of. Past mistakes. Anybody here ever make a mistake? How many people are holding on to those mistakes? Okay? That is something that you need to let go of. We are not bound by the past in any way, shape, or form. We are not bound by our history. We are not bound by the past. In order to move along those monkey bars of spiritual monkey bars, we have got to be willing to let go of our past mistakes. I got another one for you. We have to let go of our past glories sometimes too because if we're living in the past and we're so focused on our past glories and we're not able to move from that, that's not doing much good either. We need to be able to let go of habits, various habits that have just flat run their course. They just aren't what you want anymore. Let them go. One other thing. Now, a lot of letting go in our lives has to do with letting go of people, if you think about it, or relationships. Because we have things like divorce, people that transition, uh, breakups, people that come into our life for a short time and then leave. People are coming in and out of our lives quite a bit, so we better be pretty good at being able to let them go, right? But when it comes to people, there's another thing that we have to let go of. And that is any need we might have to change somebody. Okay? Any need that we might have to change somebody else. 
Now, my mother passed away when I was young, and my dad remarried, and her name is Carol, and she is a, she is a wonderful person with, filled with many, many uh, wonderful attributes. However, one of her attributes was not punctuality. She was always late, and it drove my dad cuckoo, okay? Because to him, his value, he valued being on time. That was something that showed respect, right? And so I would watch this tension between the two of them because he was trying to change her to become a person that's on time all the time, and she was having none of it, right? So that's the problem when we try to change somebody else. We can't do it. It's impossible. The only one that can change me is me. And the only one that can change you is you. And that's all she wrote on that. That's it. So if you are stuck in a situation where you are feeling that you need to change somebody, and maybe it's somebody that has issues with sobriety, and maybe it's somebody that just sees life differently and you, you're not digging it. I mean, maybe they're really negative about everything and, and you're just like, boy, why don't you look at life like this or whatever it might be. You can't change to anybody else. You just can't. Now, if wanting to change other people is your thing, you got to let it go. Because it just cannot happen and it will not happen. Now, have you ever been on the other side of that? You know what I'm talking about. Somebody wants to change you? Yeah, I went through a lot of that before I met my wife. You know, people that, that I meet and they want to change who I am, right? How does that feel? That doesn't work very well, does it? Or, even better yet, the person that's like a chameleon. Okay? And what I mean by that is they change for whoever it is that they're involved with. They change to be and to please that person. They change who they actually are. And I picked up a wonderful quote on that. If you don't show up as yourself, people will fall in love with someone you're not. If you don't show up as yourself, people will fall in love with someone that you're not. And what a prison that creates, right? That, that, that is a tough, tough position to get ourselves into. Now, the practitioners, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the practitioners are going through a process of going through all of the new curriculum. We decided as a group that we would go through the newest curriculum, which is very substantial. So every two weeks we have a conference call and we go through a different section and, and it's really nice. And, and one of the assignments for the last section, which I led and it's my own assignment, so I guess that's why I did it, I don't know. But anyway, one of the assignments for the last section was to select a sentence out of our reading and then just sort of expound upon it and, and something that might have touched you or whatever. And so the sentence that I, that I chose was, no one can find God for us. Each individual must do this for himself or herself. No one can find God for us. Each individual must do this for himself or herself. And the reason that that rang for me is because sometimes as a father, I wonder, am I exposing my children enough to spirituality and to this teaching? Now, when they were younger, I taught fun day school, I took them to a Silomar, I did a lot of reading with them, music, you name it. But then they got to a point where they just really weren't interested. You see, silly me, I thought if I had exposed them to all of these things, that they would embrace this teaching the same way that I did. But that, it doesn't work that way. And so, what I have come to realize is that I can't, I can't find God for them. And what I further realized 
is that that same power, that same entity, that same love, that same joy that is within me, that wisdom, is also within them. And that the best thing that I can do as a father is to work on me. The best thing I can do as a father is to work on my own spirituality. And I believe that that's the best thing we can do, not only as a father, but as a person. The best thing e any one of us can do. If we're in a situation uh, where we're feeling uncomfortable, maybe we want somebody to change or what have you, you know what? That is that finger that's pointing out to that person that you want to change needs to go right back here. Because there is something within you that needs to be worked on. There is something within you that needs to be changed. And guess what? You can't change them anyway. And the only one you can change is you, right? And so what I came to the conclusion of is that they have a relationship with God. And their relationship in, with God is none of my business. I don't know what that relationship is that they have with God. It's personal to them. And that's okay. But what I can do as a father is I can embrace them. I can embrace their path. I can embrace their spiritual path and know that it is all good. And I can relax. Why can I relax? Because I know how life works. When you are spiritually mindful, you know how life works. You can just relax. Hmm. Now, sometimes with changes and being willing to let go, if we hold on to certain things, it can affect us physically. You know, Louise Hay, and I was trying to remember her name. I came up with Lester Hayes and, <laughs> I mean, all these different names this morning. I was like, what is her name? Louise Hay. Louise Hay has an entire book on healing, okay? And it's all tied to different things that we can address and or look at within ourselves that are tied to various ailments that not, might be happening. So I want to tell you a little story. It's a story of my aunt, my Aunt Betty. My Aunt Betty was a great lady. She was awesome. When my mom passed away, she was right there for me all the way. She taught me how to play baseball. She taught me how to bowl. She taught me about patience. She taught me about peacefulness. She had the most incredible marriage you ever saw, and I lived with them for a year. She had a light in her eye. And a twinkle and a sparkle, she loved, absolutely loved life. When Elizabeth and I got married, she came to our wedding. She was about 84 at the time. Came up from uh, San Diego. And you know at the reception, she danced every single dance. <laughs> she was a character. She, she and, and, you know, she would tell me stories about um, her father taking her and my mother to go listen to Dr. Holmes in Long Beach. They grew up in Long Beach. That was before I even knew anything about the teaching. That, you know, I, I hadn't even known anything about this. So, anyway, so I got word that she had transitioned. And when I got word that she had transitioned... You know, I, I felt bad, but I was told that she had transitioned like a month and a half earlier. So this is a person very important to me. And that they had already had a memorial service and so on and so forth. And so I was really hurt by that. And so for whatever reason, I chose to just kind of go in, to not go inside in a good way, but just sort of shut down. I didn't have my spiritual practice. I made myself busier. Anybody ever do that? Make yourself so busy, fill your agenda so full that you don't have time to actually reflect and think and get into that place. That's what I did. I busied myself up. 
I busied myself up so much that I came to, I was driving, and I came to an um, intersection, and I stopped. And the light changed green, that was fine, and I kind of glanced over to my left, and I was making a left-hand turn, and I went out into the intersection, and bam! A car didn't see that the light had changed red, and I got hit at about 45 miles an hour right on the side, right on the driver's side. My shoulder was pretty banged up. You know, it, was, it wasn't this shoulder for some reason, it was this one, but it was pretty banged up. And so I got out, you know, and took care of all that stuff and went and got x-rays and all that. And then what did I do? I went right back to work, right? Oh, it's all right, no big deal. That lasted for about a day, and then the next day I went to work, then I came home, and my entire back seized up. I could not move, and I don't know if any of you have had issues with your back before to a point where you cannot move. It wasn't the first time this has happened for me, but I mean, I could not move at all. How I got into my bed, I have no idea. So here I am, I'm sitting in bed. I can't move one way, my shoulder hurts the other, I can't roll, trying to find a position just to be comfortable in. I felt like God put me in a timeout. <laughs> and I was sitting there. And I decided, well, maybe I need to do some treatment, you know. So I began my treatment. And I began to reflect. And something I hadn't really even thought of or made a connection with was my aunt. And she came up in my mind. And I realized, duh, there is no time, space, or anything else. I have a perfect opportunity right now to say goodbye. I could have my own memorial service right then and there. And I did. And I told her how much I loved her. And I told her what she meant to me. And I told her about all the experiences that we had. And it was great. It was amazing. For about an hour, hour and a half. And I woke up, and I, and I didn't wake up, but I got out of that. And I felt so relieved. And then I had to pee. <laughs> As you can imagine, that's really difficult when you can't move, right? <laughs> but I felt so much better that I kind of eased up a little bit. I went, oh, that doesn't feel bad. And I turned, I put my feet on the ground, I raised myself up. Wow, I feel pretty good. I walked in, took care of my business, went out to the, to the family and they looked at me and they said, what are you doing out of bed? I said, I'm healed. <laughs> I said, I had to pee and my, my wife said, well, thank God for that. <laughs> But I was healed. When we hold certain things inside, it does have an impact on our physical body. And when we release and we let go, and we embrace a higher thought and higher idea, I, I, a higher idea, it brings us freedom. Freedom to just live. Freedom to experience life. Freedom to be happy. And so what I'd like to do right now, I'd like to, uh, actually I'd like to share with you a quote from Dr. David Walker, who I, who I listen to, who I love very much, and he he's, uh, was a former um, um, reverend at the uh, Los Angeles Center, and he's transitioned but uh, for whatever reason, I was able to meet him, and he just he speaks to my heart. And so I wanted to share what, what he has to say about having a relaxed mind. Relaxed mind? What do you have to be relaxed about? Your understanding of the way life works. Leaving their lives over to perfect right action, things work out in a way that is right for them, 
which is none of our business. I think a huge problem with the people of the world today, myself included, is our inability or willingness to just relax. When I'm uptight and someone tells me to relax, I just want to slap them. <laughs> Isn't that true? The last thing, when you're feeling a little tense and someone says, oh, just relax, boy, that's the last thing you want to do. That kind of amps it up, doesn't it? We aren't relaxed sometimes because we forget our truth. We don't trust the divine principle will take our consciousness and work it out to a logical sequence of experience. We forget. But I'd like to take the time right now to remember. So I'm going to ask you, what is it that you need to let go of? What is it that you need to embrace? And so I'm going to ask everybody to go within. <laughs> and know with me that there is this power. It is a power that, that is greater than we are and we are able to use it We are able to use it to deal with life effectively. And there is a principle that we can depend upon that changes our thoughts into our experience. And so what I know about that is the truth of who I am is that I am whole, that I am perfect, I am complete, that I am an expression of the one. For there is only one. And so I know that the way that my reflection matches who I am inside is by a process. And that process is spiritual mindfulness. And that spiritual mindfulness is our willingness to let go, to identify, our willingness to look within And to identify thoughts and ideas that are not constructive to us. And be willing to let them go. And so I ask you right now to think about those thoughts and ideas that you may be willing to let go of. Examine that thought and idea carefully. Think about how that has in your past affected you. And take a deep breath and release it and let it go. And as you do, feel the light and the love flood in as it is replaced by spirit. And now, what is it that you're ready to embrace? What is it that you're ready to manifest in your life? What new thought do you have? And know with me now that that new thought takes place right here, right now, because I affirm it. I affirm that this change has taken place. I affirm that this principle has no choice other than to act on this new thought. And so, as we move forward, we do so on those monkey bars, those spiritual monkey bars of life. Experiencing 
expressing and expanding our consciousness. And so it is with gratitude. Gratitude for all those little things that happen within us, those little tweaks, those little tension that we might feel and a little anxiety here and a little stress there because those are just a little alarms for us to know that those are things that we can turn to, that we can let go of and then move us so that who we are on the inside is reflected as who we are on the outside. And so I release these ideas, these thoughts, knowing that they have already taken place. And what I know is that as we experience this growth, this expansion of consciousness, that we also experience life in a greater way. We see the beauty that surrounds us in a deeper and greater way. Our relationships are deeper, more meaningful, and filled with even greater life and light and understanding. The abundance that we seek, we know already that we have. Any need that we may have to change others is completely obliterated. For when we are happy and content, doesn't seem to have a need to change others. And so in appreciation and in the form of release, I release these ideas knowing that it is already so. And together we say, and so it is.